All right, let's begin. Welcome to today's webcast, How to Find Lateral Movement, Reduce Dwell Times with Zeke, Mitre Attack, and the Bazaar Project, presented by Corelight and Mitre. I'm John Gamble, Director of Product Marketing here at Corelight, and I'll be emceeing today's webcast. We've got two esteemed panelists on the line. I would encourage you to ask questions. Uh, if you have questions, you can use your control panel, uh, your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll see them. We're going to hold questions until the end of today's presentation, and we'll save five to 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions. Today's speakers. Uh, Mark, could you introduce yourself? Hi, thank you. Uh... John, my name is Mark Fernandez. I'm a lead cybersecurity engineer at MITRE Corporation. I've been working with uh, the Zeke product, or formerly called Bro, for a few years now. Back in 2016, I presented at BroCon for a protocol analyzer that I developed. And uh, this newer project called Bazaar has been a lot of fun to develop, and it's gotten a lot of very positive attention. So I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Mark. James, could you introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is James Schweitzer. I'm the Eastern Federal SE Director for Corelight. Uh, I've been using Zeek for a couple of years, not quite as long as Mark, but am very much uh, an enthusiast. Glad to be here today. Excellent. Briefly, the agenda. Uh, so first, we'll be talking about the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which I'm sure many of you on the call are familiar with, but we'll just be baselining everyone's knowledge of that before we kind of dive into the meat of today's presentation. Uh, we'll be covering uh, the open source Zeek project and showing how the data it exposes can help you uh, discover TTPs in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And then we'll be specifically diving into the MITRE Bazaar project that you heard Mark mention, and he'll be presenting uh, how he came to create that project, what its capabilities are, and what its future looks like. And uh, we'll also have a section where we'll present uh, additional uh, lateral movement uh, and threat hunting techniques based on Zeek data that help map uh, to TTPs uh, in the ATT&CK framework itself. So it'll be a very hands-on webcast. Uh, you'll, get, you'll walk away with some great practical examples of how to instrument this in your own environment, and we'll save Q&A till the end, but please uh, feel free to ask questions at any point in your question uh, control tab at right. So with that, James, uh, I'll let you take over. Excellent. Thank you, John. Uh, as John mentioned, today we're going to talk about the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and just to level set quickly, ATT&CK, it's a globally accessible knowledge base of, of adversary tactics and techniques based on op real world observations. Uh, this knowledge base, really think of it as it's a foundation for the development of threat models and methodologies. Originally, it was developed as a, a host based model, but it's really evolved. And I think as we'll talk about today, there are quite a few techniques that can be observed on the network. It's open and available to any person or organization that wishes to use it at, at no charge, and it's constantly evolving. Uh, what you see on your screen are, I believe it's the 12 tactic categories. Uh, if you're interested, there are other attack webinars uh, that address a few different tactic categories that Corelight has released. Today, we're going to talk about lateral movement. And when we think about lateral movement, it's all about the adversary moving throughout your network. Now, I bolded several key points in this, uh, control, exploring, pivoting. These are things that the adversary needs to do to move laterally. And, and it, it's important that people understand that the adversary has to learn about the environment. They may do a lot of reconnaissance from the outside to learn about your environment, but once they're inside, they may fumble a bit while they're learning. And really, this is the time where we want to really pounce as a defender, because we all know on the call, people are going to click emails. Uh, the adversary is very talented. It is no longer a poorly crafted email that someone's going to click on. Uh, it can be something that appears like it's coming from a colleague. The adversary's goal is to be stealthy, but a well-instrumented network has the ability to observe their actions. Now, what we'll see here, uh, there are a couple of techniques that list, oh, there we go, sorry. Uh, there are a couple of techniques. In these, pass the hash, pass the ticket. Some people may be familiar with a couple of those. Uh, I'm gonna mention really T1076, something from earlier this summer that had the InfoSec community really weary of a, uh, a weaponized Blue Keep vulnerability. Uh, Blue Keep was set to reportedly allow for unauthenticated remote code execution via Microsoft's RDP. 
uh, in the chat window, you'll see there was a good kind of blog that was written by Aaron Soto of Corelight and Matt Bromley of SANS. And there's also a kind of a succinct conversation about that uh, on the Twitter thread. But I think these are just some examples of things. And today we will talk a little bit about uh, remote file copy in specific. But before we really get into any of that, what I wanna do is I wanna be sure that we talk a little bit about the open source network security monitor, Zeek. Zeek was formerly known as Bro, as mentioned earlier. And what it does is it creates logs. It, it can extract files and it has a, a Turing complete scripting language that you can use to create custom insights. And really what that is, is that's really bespoke curated data. You know, you can have Zeek configured and installed and you're gonna immediately receive value. But if you invest time kind of determining what files you want to extract, what insights you want from the logs in order to extend them. And uh, there was a great work that's done, I believe a uh, Neuron on Twitter, where he extended the HTTP log, adding the HTTP origin field. It's a quite simple script in order to extract that. But really, before we get into the details of that, what is Zeek? You know, who uses it? Where did it come from? Uh, Vern Paxson created it while working on his PhD in the you know, mid-1990s. It, it's been in use for 25 years, and the community uses it for really training, but not only for training, but also for network defense. You know what you'll see? SANS has it in a couple of courses, Cisco with their CCNA, um, multiple vendors use this. It, it's really stood the test of time. Think of how much your computers and operating systems have changed over the past five years, 10 years, let alone 25. And it really goes to show the how the op, how Zeek as a network security monitor was really ahead of its time. But really what's also very exciting is currently the community-driven insights are amazing. Uh, today we're gonna talk specifically about Bazaar and what Mark has done, but let's not forget about what Salesforce has released in the past year or so with the JA3 fingerprinting of TLS connections, hash, fingerprinting of SSH connections. Also, they've recently released the Google Quick Analyzer or correlate with a community ID. And if you're unfamiliar, community ID uh, allows you to pivot to other data sources. And we'll provide an example and talk about that. It's very comparable to the unique identifier that's available in Zeek. But these are only a few. There are many more. As, as you see on the slide, there are over 80 uh, community-driven insights, and it's still growing. But as we think about this, how do we deploy Zeek? Is it going, is it another agent? You know, is it something that's actively in the network that could potentially affect an SLA? Zeek is deployed out of band. Uh, if you have a tap or a packet broker or a span, as you see on the screen left with, you know, XESC packet, you take that and send a feed into Zeek. Zeek takes the data, converts it, raw packets on the wire into a, a, an ASCII style for, format, it can send that to an analytic platform or to disk. I mean, if you prefer grep and awk, that's, that, that is something that is supported. We can batch files and send it there. But also a key point you see along the bottom of this graphic is data can be enriched. There are a couple of frameworks that Zeeks makes use of. Uh, one is the input framework. So with this, if you have something like a, an IPAM, take for instance, InfoBlocks, you can use that and take that data and extend the logs. So if you record information like, for instance, maybe the city of where uh, an office is located or the floor in a data center, you can extend that information. So now your analyst, not only will Zeek make sense of the network connection, but it also provides specific context around who is using it. You know, where is that device located? Is it, you know, do I have a printer initiating a connection to a server? Um, it, it can really be quite valuable extending with the input framework. But there's also on the bottom right, you see threat intelligence platforms through the Intel framework. The Intel framework allows you to have targeted indicators so that you can say, if I see something like this, I know it's bad. Don't think of it as an IDS. Occasionally people would talk about Zeek as an IDS, but think of it more as, as something that is targeted where you're you know, performing network traffic analysis, network security monitoring. And I'd really be remiss if I didn't talk about file analysis for file extraction. Zeek has the ability to carve files. When those files are carved, it will perform a, a static analysis. And I'll give you an example of that. But also you can take and put that into a location. So then you can have uh, security tools performing analysis looking for malicious intent. 
uh, whether that's in a sandbox, dynamic, or static analysis as we go through. But why, you know, so we talked a little bit about the history of where it came from, that it's still around, how it's deployed. But I also think really a key piece of this is why do incident responders and threat hunters love using Zeek? You know, why did one of the reasons when Mark was writing the development, did he choose to use Zeek? And I think part of it comes down to is the logs, you know, the, the open source capability, the Turing complete scripting language, but it's the data that's available. What you see on your screen are a small sample set of some of the log types that are generated. Uh, Zeek has the ability where you can write custom parsers. So you can write, if you have a protocol or you want to extend an existing parser, that can be written to extend to have that. But in this case, if you're unfamiliar with how uh, Zeek is used, the con log is similar to NetFlow in the sense that it tells you about a connection between two IP addresses. How long was it going on? What was the protocol in use? Um, what's the service that can be identified if it's tunneled in a GRE tunnel, for instance, or uh, IPv4 and v6? It's going to have that. But oftentimes over that connection, what's being performed? Is HTTP being performed, HTTPS? Uh, is it DNS? You know, what's taking place with that? If you look on the screen, what you'll see is kind of in a light blue line, almost aquamarine. I uh, feel like I'm, I'm targeting my inner Bob Ross. Uh, going through, you'll see those lines kind of linking each one of these logs together. What that provides is that means that if an analyst finds something of interest, whether it's in a connection log because maybe it, it was too long a connection between two devices, or it's the HTTP log because they visited a site that was on a known watch list. It, once they find that item of interest, they can use that unique identifier value and they can pivot to find other items of interest. So the example I would say is, if you think of a spear phishing attack, spear phishing you know, hasn't changed in, in 20 years, but if they receive an email and Zeek is monitoring and it sees the SMTP log, it's going to extract specific fields from that. If someone clicks a link that was in that SMTP log, there's going to be a con because it's showing that it was created as a connection and there's an HTTP log because a browser was spawned. By doing that and being able to pivot, we're simplifying the job of an analyst to go through. And as we go through and, and talk about that, I think it's good to give a, a quick five minutes of hunting with Zeek. As we talked about earlier, in this case, our triggering event is someone visited a site. You see circled in yellow, mybusinessdoc.com. As they're going through this, what do we want, you know, we want to find what events occurred related to that. Well, as we go through, we'll see circled in green are the unique identifiers. So that's the value that we're going to pivot on next for that HTTP transaction. So we talked earlier in the abstract about what a con log is, but here you can actually see one using Elastic. And again, this could be done in Splunk, QRadar, uh, you know, it, your choice of analytic platform is really whatever you want to send the data to. Circled in red are some of the interesting uh, values for the fields. Duration, history is one that I personally like because it's a summary of the TCP control flags that you have. And also capitalization tells you if it was the originator or the responder. And you'll see down at the bottom, you know, tunnel parents. If this is a tunneled session and in GRE or Teredo, it'll be listed there as well as the service. But what's really unique as you go through is you'll see in green, I want to I want to pivot. I'm pivoting now. I can see that HTTP log because what was highlighted in green, I was able to rapidly pivot from one log to the next. Within this HTTP log, there's a lot of valuable content, whether it's the method, uh, files that were exchanged, the status code. You know, if you look at host that's circled in red at the top, if that was an IP address instead of uh, an FQDN, then I would know that the user manually typed in that IP address. Maybe that's an indicator of something of interest that's gonna cause me to want to find out a little bit more about it, or maybe it's something hard coded in a script. In this case, as we go through, we talked about the green unique identifier, but because a file was exchanged, Zeek has the concept of a file unique identifier. So you can use that in order to find files that have been extracted. And I spoke earlier about static analysis that's performed. When Zeek sees a file, 
it's immediately going to generate an MD5. Uh, it can also generate SHA-1s and SHA-256. You can use the Turing Complete Scripting language to write a script to go use an API. Maybe you want to send that information out to VirusTotal uh, to know if that's been seen as malicious or Team Cymru's malware hash registry. Those are some of the things that you can do, but I thought it was important as we, as we seek out to level set for the webinar to understand the history of where Zeek is from, uh, what some of the data looks like, and how it can be extended as we go through. Awesome, thank you, James. Uh, Mark? Thank you, John. Uh, a little bit of background on the Bazaar project. This began as a small internal research project within MITRE based on the following research proposal to detect adversary behaviors, such as those in the attack model, via internal network monitoring. So when you look at the attack model, some adversary techniques necessarily generate network traffic. For example, lateral movement techniques like remote file copy. So you could use network monitoring to detect remote file copy activity from one workstation to another workstation in your local area network. There are other attack, uh, attack techniques that also generate network traffic, but maybe it isn't so obvious at first, not until you look a little deeper into the details of the technique or look at the Windows API, how it could be used, or maybe even the Windows network protocols underneath. But when you look deeper, you'll find other techniques that perhaps normally wouldn't generate network traffic because that command or that action would be executed locally on the host that's under attack. But it could also be executed remotely against another host on your network, and therefore you could detect it with internal network monitoring. So with this insight, the Bazaar project started out <clears throat> excuse me, with a focus on the attack tactic categories of credential access, discovery, lateral movement, and execution. Along the way, I encountered some low-hanging fruit in the categories of persistence and defense evasion, so I added those in too. But the problem with internal monitoring is that internal network traffic can be very noisy. There's so much activity, legitimate authorized activity, in your network being generated by your workforce that creates an overwhelming volume of network traffic. On a Windows network, you have two very common and very <clears throat> powerful network protocols that are basically the foundation of most user-based and system administrator-based activities. You have the server message block protocol, SMB, that facilitates things like file and print sharing, mapping network drives. You also have the remote procedure call protocol, or RPC, and Almost every system service in the Windows operating system has one or more RPC interfaces associated with it. And Windows has a lot of system services, almost all of which can be accessed remotely with the proper credentials. But once you start analyzing these two protocols, you do a deep dive into the technical specification and then compare that to the attack model. You find applicability to more than just lateral movement. Um, but we still have the problem that the internal traffic can be really noisy. So we needed something to help dig into these protocols and filter only the details that we care about the most. So the technology I chose for the project was Zeek. Uh, well, at the time it was called Bro. This was back in early 2018. Um, the key benefits to using Zeek is that it's open source software and was highly customizable, which means that if I needed a special function that perhaps Zeek didn't already do, I could just write the code myself and add it to my instance of Zeek. Zeek also provides deep packet inspection, including the SMB and RPC protocols, which allows us to filter out a lot of the noise and focus on the parts we care about the most. This was a very beneficial and very powerful starting point for this project. The result of which was this open source project called Bazaar which uh, stands for Bro Zeek Attack-Based Analytics and Reporting. So the key to any successful project is, is having a catchy or memorable acronym. So the acronym BZAR is a play on words for bizarre, meaning something very strange or unusual, especially as to cause interest or amusement. So that interpretation, I think, is quite appropriate for this project. 
and it is open source. You can uh, go to the GitHub is where we published it, and you could go there to download the bizarre script. Um, yeah, so oh, that that is what bizarre is. It's a collection of scripts for the Bro or for the Zeek uh, tool that identifies certain attack-based indicators, performs some analytics. Some analytics are simple. Some are a little more complex. And it writes these uh, special notices to the Zeek notice log. Well, back in 2017, MITRE, the MITRE attack team published a technical report titled Finding Cyber Threats with Attack-Based Analytics. The paper described a seven-step process <clears throat> looking at steps one, two, and three that really summarizes the major bullets that I showed on the previous slide. Step one, to identify behaviors. Now, this is what I did when I developed the objective and the attack, uh, identified the attack categories that I wanted to go after. Step two, acquiring the data. I mean, sometimes that could be the hardest part of the process is just acquiring the data that you need. And that summarizes the problem statement and the technology selection. I needed something with the granularity, with enough granularity to detect the very specific items within those network protocols that I was looking for. Step three, develop analytics. Uh, that summarizes kind of the final product here, which was uh, the set of scripts called Bazaar. And before jumping into Bazaar, let's, I wanted to talk a little more about the SMB and RPC analyzers in Zeek first. So this, I, I apologize, these numbers are relatively dated. Uh, this was what, when I did my initial research back in early 2018, the, the BRO or the Zeek SMB protocol analyzer defined 145 different SMB message types that the, the analyzer would parse. And that constitutes or that, that comprises SMB version 1 protocol, SMB version 2 protocol, the commands, and the various subcommands. For the RPC protocol analyzer, uh, DCE stands for Distributed Computing Environment, and the Bro Z, uh, they they kind of differentiate the DCE RPC that that Microsoft implements in their operating system versus the old Sun-based Remote Procedure Call Protocol. There, there's two different analyzers for it. Specifically, the Windows-based one is the DCE RPC Protocol Analyzer. Um, There are, it identifies 81 different interface definitions and more than 1,400 methods. So you could think of, of an RPC interface almost like a Windows DLL and a, a method being like a function that that DLL exports. So you have an interface that's associated maybe to a particular application or system service. And that interface can expose lots of different remote procedure functionality. Um, so the entire collection of those identified that, that Zeek recognizes and identifies is more than 1,400. And I mean, both of these lead to two really, really interesting questions, right? So if Zeek identifies or recognizes 145 different SMB message types, well, how many message types actually exist? in the Windows operating system. And the same thing for RPC. How many different RPC interfaces and methods exist in the Windows operating system? Well, those are some good questions. <laughs> um, and I did last year spent a little bit of time digging into it, into the Microsoft Developer Network documentation. And I counted 332 different SMB commands and subcommands. Uh, for RPC, there was more than 300 interfaces and more than 2,500. Uh, method. Uh, there could be more. That's just kind of where I drew the line and, and stopped counting. And based on this research, I was able to add, or rather bizarre, um, adds 144 more interface definitions and more than 1,100 additional methods to what Zeke recognizes. Um, it's almost double what it previously was. Two additional analyzers I want to touch on real quick that, that were really beneficial. I didn't think about using these at first, but 
once I got into the flow of the project, I realized these could be really, really helpful. So I, I just labeled these as bonuses. The Authentication Protocol Analyzer. Zeek has the built-in analyzers for Kerberos, GSS API, Windows MTLM authentication protocols that are used in SMB and RPC uh, authentication. So I didn't know how I was going to use it at the time, but I figured this, this those, that capability would be very, very helpful at some point. The other one was the file extraction analyzer, as, as James described uh, a little while ago. The file extraction analyzer, it will pull files out of a network stream as it sees it going across the network. And that is really helpful for SMB. So if there's a, a malicious file, if there's an adversary on your network that's doing remote file copy and they're transferring their malicious files from one endpoint to another, well, with Bazaar and Zeek, you could make a copy of that and store it uh, real time as it's being sent across the network. Because oftentimes, once you're alerted by endpoint security systems that something unusual has happened and you want to go back and find the file that, that may have been the source of that unusual activity, you know, the malicious actor may have already deleted those artifacts from the local file system. But this way, we can save a copy of it before the actor even has a chance to delete it from the system. And that's a great bonus feature that, that we take advantage of in Bazaar. One more thing I wanted to talk about with these two protocols, uh, specifically the SMB and the RPC protocol analyzers, is that most of the indicators that Bazaar looks for, they're already logged in the Zeek SMB logs and the Zeek RPC logs. So if you ingest these logs into your SIM, then you could apply the same logic that Bazaar uses to detect, analyze, and alert, but using your SIM instead of using Bazaar. However, uh, a problem that some organizations run into is that the SMB and RPC logs can be pretty large files. So they may not, you may not be able to ingest those protocol specific logs into your SIM. Some organizations might have to pick and choose. So perhaps they choose only the Zeek notice logs and the connection logs. Um, and the Zeek notice log is where the major alerts and items of interest are logged. So using that knowledge, Bazaar goes ahead and writes to the notice log. So if you need to pick and choose what you ingest into your SIM, then you'll get all the bizarre and other major Zeek alerts by ingesting the notice log. So this slide shows is a summary of the different attack techniques detected with bizarre. With across the top are the attack tactic categories, and down the columns are the different attack techniques using the technique ID and the, and the name of it. So there are 19 techniques listed uh, among the categories of execution, persistence, defense evasion, credential access, discovery, and lateral movement. Almost all of them are RPC based. So the Bazaar detects specific RPC interfaces and methods that are attributed to certain attack techniques. And all of them are RPC based except the lateral movement category. For lateral movement, Bazaar is using uh, detecting specific uh, identifiers in the SMB traffic. And so for this talk, just the next couple of slides, I'll focus on the lateral movement. And oh, however, I did wanted to add that next month, I'm also presenting uh, the Bazaar at the Zeek Week conference. So I'll go into more detail into the, to the rest of the information presented on, on this chart. So bizarre lateral movement, what are the indicators that it's looking for when we're looking at remote file copy and Windows admin shares? Specifically, bizarre looks for only the admin file shares, which is the admin dollar sign share and the C dollar sign share, which allow access to the file system on the remote host across the network. Bazaar ignores IPC dollar signs, which is used for name pipes. Um, for name pipes, I mean, one of the in indicators that that gives you is the affiliation with RPC activity being tunneled over the SMB protocol. But 
Zeek gives us so much specificity with RPC that we know exactly what interfaces and methods are being accessed that we don't need main pipes as an additional indicator. So Bazaar filters out and ignores IPC dollar sign. Um, for lateral movement in general, Bazaar looks for an SMB write to either of those admin file shares, admin dollar sign or C dollar sign. If this is observed, then it reports an attack lateral movement alert to the Z notice log. That's the first bullet under analytics, under lateral movement. It looks for an SMB write to admin dollar sign or an SMB write to C dollar sign. If it sees that, it'll trigger that analytic and it'll write that alert to the notice log. And recall that Zeek has that file extraction analyzer. So Bazaar has an option to save a copy of the file associated with that SMB write action and it will report a second entry in the notice log that says lateral movement extracted file and that log entry will contain the full path and name of the file as it was written on the remote host or the victim um, and that information can aid an incident response and of course a copy of the file is extracted from the TCP stream and saved on the Zeek pl platform for further examination. The third analytic on that list is multiple attempts at lateral movement. So I, I developed this analytic for a specific use case. So consider, what if your organization disables remote access to admin dollar sign or C dollar sign? Or I guess to both, if it restricts access to both of those. I mean, this is possible with a quick registry modification in Windows, and it would be a great cybersecurity mitigation. But what would happen though if malware got a foothold on your network and tried to move laterally using Windows admin shares? Well, fortunately, those lateral movement attempts would fail because of the security policy. And it would also fail repeatedly because the malware might try numerous different IP addresses or hosts, might try it repeatedly in vain to connect the admin dollar sign or C dollar sign, not yet knowing that access is disabled by policy. So that would be, that's, that's a great scenario, but would Bazaar detect this activity? So given the previous analytics, the answer would be no, because those analytics trigger only if there is an SMB write. So I developed this third one that says, well, if this scenario occurs, if you see multiple attempts to connect to admin dollar sign or C dollar sign, and if it's originating from the same endpoint, then it's gonna trigger this analytic for multiple attempts at lateral movement. Um, and Zeek has this wonderful feature called summary statistics. And it allows me to set the threshold for let's say 50 attempts within five minutes originating from the same IP address. If this threshold is reached, then Bazaar reports this to the notice log. And the fourth analytic on that list is for lateral movement and execution occurring together against the same endpoint. Um, so this might be the most useful alert that Bazaar has to offer. Let's say that lateral movement is legitimate and authorized activity on your network. So your system administrators or whoever, there, there's a certain person or group of persons in your network that's allowed to connect to admin dollar sign and move files around. That's totally legitimate. So you can whitelist that and ignore it. But let's further say that remote execution, let's say that's also allowed on your network, right? There's a different group of, of administrators that are allowed to remotely execute files or apps on, on other workstations in the network. So if that's authorized and legitimate, we could whitelist and ignore remote execution. But what if both of those activities occurring at the same time or within a narrow time window occurring against the same endpoint, maybe that's the suspicious activity that you want to investigate. So that's what this, act, this uh, analytic provides you. Um, and, and that brings up some points as well about tuning it for your environment. Um, Bazaar has some whitelisting features they're they're not the best right now it was thrown in kind of haphazardly at the end kind of as a proof of concept to say yeah you could whitelist and ignore but 
the whitelist, it needs further development, and that's uh, that's an update that, that MITRE is working on and we'll be publishing here in the coming weeks or months. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide and it's not advancing. Hi, sorry, the slide's not advancing. Can I get help? Okay. Okay. Looks like John had a had a problem with his connection. Let's hold on one second, Mark. Um, so I could talk to the next slide so we don't have uh, dead okay. air. There's nothing worse. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide, Mark. Okay, great. I don't think I have control of the presentation anymore. Um, but I could the, the the final slide that I have is just the what what gets reported to the notice log. So in the case of um, let's say the lateral movement and next extracted file example. So you'd have uh, you'd have the notice string that says attack lateral movement extracted file. There would be a string that says save the copy of the file written to the admin share, and then it would provide the full SMB path and file name of what was written onto the victim host, and it would contain the log entry would also have the IP addresses and the TCP or UDP ports involved. It would have the Zeek connection ID, which James described earlier, and, the, and it would also have the Zeek file ID, and there would be some other connection information, but those are the highlights. Those are the, the, the main, main pieces of information um, of interest. So Mark, lastly, I'm share, Mark, I'm going to share my screen and see because we're having uh, connectivity difficulty, so hold on one second. Okay, great. And I mentioned a moment ago, as far as improved whitelisting of being able to say, you know, this this endpoint is is authorized to be this activity, so let's ignore it because we don't want to have too many false positives in the logs. Um, that again, that's one of the updates that's going to be coming down the road here soon is improving the granularity on that, being able to to whitelist specifically by attack technique, and another one is to be able to disable certain attack techniques from detection or reporting. So let's say there's you have one that's that's such an authorized or such a legitimate activity that you know, maybe putting the whitelist together is just going to be too too much information. It would be easier to just disable that. You could disable that as well. So working on those two updates and, and hopefully in the next few weeks or a couple months those will be pushed out. And that that concludes my portion. So I'll be happy to take questions at the end, and I'll hand it back over to James. Mark, that's that's great. What's going to happen? Sorry, we're having audio difficulties, everyone. Uh, John, who's our admin, is going to uh, reset his application. So hopefully, we'll be able to have access and share the final remaining slides. We'll wait. Give us one minute. While we start with that, the next item that we were going to address, I, I can talk to a few of these points. Uh, what we were going to look at is really saying the MITRE framework is really a framework that continues to evolve. And part of that evolution is thinking about what are new tactics and techniques that are observed. Uh, for example, there is one technique that's really system and network discovery. And in the, it's, 
if anyone is following along, it, it's uh, item technique T1049. In this technique, they talk about using net use and specific adversaries that have used that in NBT stat. And one of the things that I was thinking about is continuing to expand and use maybe PowerShell to execute some of those same commands. You know, you can use PowerShell to remotely map drives, to execute commands. And if you do that, PowerShell is going to use HTTP. And with Zeek, uh, Zeek is able to parse that, recognize that as a post, you know, show the user agent and provide additional visibility that today isn't a defined technique, but it falls within the framework. So it's something that continues to evolve and grow as we see red teams use uh, new uh, attack vectors going through. Similarly, uh, there is one for remote file copy uh, for T1105. And in this case, uh, we provided a, an attack webinar to talk about this using uh, a PAKE. It's an RFC for password authenticated key agreement. It's a Python tool that allows the application, if it runs on multiple workstations, to be able to send encrypted files back and forth. And it really, again, it, it goes to the power of Zeek as a, a network, uh, a network security monitor, a network traffic analysis, to be able to go through and recognize this, identify this as a an odd traffic. You know, in this case, seeing uh, high high value, high port numbers going back and forth and high traffic volumes or high numbers of packets being going back and forth. Uh, let, so just to, I wanted to really mention a few items of that. Dave, hold on one second. The organizer is trying to contact me, see if we can get audio and video back. Sorry about that, everyone. We were trying to see if we can have one last ditch effort, but uh, we're we're going to improvise, everybody. Uh, really, the last piece that we were going to talk about before we get to questions is we were going to go through and talk about community ID. We talked earlier about this, so you were able to see on the screen where we had a unique identifier. It was a value that can be used to pivot within Zeek logs when things are related. Community ID is something that was developed by uh, the, the team at Corelight and was released into the open source where it takes a five tuple of information. Uh, the source and destination IP address as well as port and the protocol and it takes that and then hashes that with MD5 to create a value. Now it, it's important to note that that value can be uh, overloaded over time but what happens is you have a short window of time whenever you need to pivot and you can pivot to another data source. So for instance, if I saw traffic uh, traversing my network that was uh, suspect, maybe it was HTTP post traffic and it was port 80 coming through, if I had that community ID value that is added, extended to the con log within Zeek, I could then pivot to something, I was going to mention uh, the HELC platform uh, as an open source tool that implements Elastic, uh, Hadoop, uh, Zeek um, into a platform, they've implemented the community ID. If you have Elastic going through generating that value from Sysmon traffic, you can rapidly pivot from your network into host generated data, and then you could see information like the process tree, the user that initiated that transaction. So it really allows you to go from observing something on the network quickly drilling down into the host and really kind of assessing, is this something, is this event an incident that requires further investigation or not? Uh, also, there's another to open source tool, Moloch, also implements community ID and is able to use it. So it's really just talking about, there are other tools out there that have been developed that really complement Zeek that allow for uh, pivoting to other data sources. That was the extent of what we wanted to address today for the presentation. So wanted to take time for questions, if anyone has any questions that they would like to send into the chat window. Or Mark, if there's any other points that you'd like to make. Um, 
No, thank you. I'll stand by for questions. Looks like I've received one question. What what do you think about Zeek relative to other deep packet inspection engines? Uh, I think this is looking for, um, you know, the way that I would look at this is Zeek is purpose built for security because it has extensibility. It's quite unique in that uh, environment. Being able to have, be able to write a parser. There's a, a tool to currently use Binpack, but there's going to be one released shortly called Spicy that allows for folks to develop custom protocol parsers, or they can come develop their own extensions. Uh, I think what that's going to do is it really gives the opportunity for uh, people that have deployed Zeek flexibility. They're not dependent on what comes out of the box or what was purely developed in the open source. If they have the resources and talent, they can extend uh, from there. Uh, looks like there was one other question. I think hey, Mark. This is Mark. Before you move on, I'd like to add to that. Please. Um, that that was one of my my considerations starting the Bazaar project was the reason I was looking so deeply into the SMB and RPC analyzers that Zeke offered was that did it detect enough? Did it make enough information available to me so that I could? do smart things with the things that I cared about. And uh, I, I half expected to, you know, maybe have to modify or add some additional features to the protocol analyzer to make those events or the, the, that metadata available um, up into the, the scripting area where, where the analysts and the, the bizarre scripts were operating. But fortunately, it was doing it. It didn't do all of the SMB protocol, but it did more than enough that I was able to do what I needed to do. And the same thing for RPC. It had enough interfaces to find and it gave enough granularity that I didn't have to make any modifications in that regard or extension. Hey, hey Mark, sorry, this is Joe Gamble. I was having technical difficulties on my end. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry about that everyone. And of course to the panelists. Um, did you guys wanna advance and do a little bit of this section or should we jump to Q and A? I think we tried to cover it. I may show just one or two quick slides. Um, if you go okay. through, let's see. If you can advance one more. And right there. So in this case, this is something I think it's good for everyone to see. Uh, the tools that are available with open source help, you know, with the elastic beats, Kafka, you know, in addition to Spark, Jupyter, Hadoop, it's tr incredible the capability that you have. But what you can do is, if you advance to the next slide, John. In this case, I'm pivoting on a value. Uh, if you can go back one. Yeah, I'm going to try to give you screen control here, James. You should have screen control now. Okay. So in this case, if you look at the top. Uh, HELC has implemented, and we'll be sure and put that in the chat window if anyone is interested in finding out more about HELC, uh, the network community ID fingerprint. By searching for that within HELC, as I mentioned earlier, you can quickly see the process tree, you know, the user that executed that process. So it's really drawing a linkage between the network and host data. It's also something that if you implemented Moloch, you could also continue with that because they've implemented community ID where you could then say, use that value, search for that, and then give me this specific PCAP for that connection. And you can search through. So again, it, it talks about Zeek as being part of a larger ecosystem, not just being uh, a singular entity in and of itself. And we were, we were into the, the Q&A, John, where we had a question that, uh, talked about the use of uh, DPI comparing Zeek relative to other DPI engines. Uh, and I provided some information and Mark also provided some feedback. I'm not sure if there are any other questions. 
Yeah, we've got a bunch. Um, so let's uh, see if we can get through them uh, in these last few minutes here. Again, apologize for the technical difficulties on my end. I'm glad we didn't drop the whole connection. Um, here's a question. Uh, is there a directory that lists community resources tied to attack like Bazaar? Uh, Mark, maybe that's a question for you. Um, there's, I think there's a few resources. On GitHub, there's the MITRE ATT&CK uh, repository. So if you go back um, on, on a previous slide was the URL for where the bizarre scripts are, are posted on GitHub. Um, it's under the, the MITRE ATT&CK repository. So there's other information there. And I think also just probably at the MITRE website, the MITRE.ATT&CK.org has community information as well or available information. Great. Thank you. There it is. I'm just going to go back to the Q&A. Yeah, I was just copying that URL. I'll paste it into the chat window so the attendees can have that there. One second. There's that link. Great. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what alerts appear in the Zeek weird log, uh, which was mentioned during today's presentation? Uh, James? Uh, the weird log, <laughs> the best way to describe the weird log is it's anything weird. Uh, it can help if you're looking at when you set up, configure your connection, if you have a, a, a symmetry problem with your traffic. So let's assume you're asymmetric and you only see one side of the conversation. That information can be generated in weirds. It's really, when Vern developed this, they developed it with the idea that anything that is truly weird uh, is going to be recorded in that log. It's a good opportunity to look and see what's on your network that really isn't isn't standard. Uh, I, I think that that's probably my best uh, explanation. Mark, do you do you have anything to add about about um, the weird? I log? remember I remember a couple years ago when I was working on the ICAP protocol analyzer. You know, the ICAP syntax is real similar to HTTP, so I was doing a lot of research in the bro. Uh, HTTP analyzer, and I think I saw one or two weird event generation or notice uh, generated in the HTTP analyzer, like it, it encountered something in the packet that didn't really quite conform to the protocol, so it generated a weird message um, or a weird log entry. So I guess depending on the protocol analyzer and who developed it, you might get some weird entries from there. Great. Uh, we've got a number of questions that I'll just answer quick uh, with one answer about the slides and the recording. Uh, yes, the slides will be made available and the recording as well. Um, James, maybe I'll re-record your section with you and then I'll splice that in so it's a seamless uh, recording. But yes, the, the recording and the, um, and the slides will be made available to attendees. Uh, we've got some more questions here. Um, do the four analytics you mentioned cover all 19 attack techniques from those slides? Oh, uh, good question. No, not at all. Those those four analytics were specific just to lateral movement. Um, there are, I, I didn't speak about most of what Bazaar does, only the, the lateral movement relevant pieces. There are other analytics for RPC execution, for RPC discovery, for all of those different attack uh, tactic areas. And I, I just didn't get a chance do the, the, the focus of today's talk to, to get into those today. No worries. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, this is probably for you, Mark. Uh, have you considered building support for RDP into Bazaar? Um, there, there's not yet. There's a little bit of a additional expansion, not just in some of those whitelisting and, and toggling features, but also detecting additional attack techniques. Um, that'll be coming out probably in the next couple of months as well, but RDP isn't in that scope yet. But that being said, there's a lot with all those RPC functions. You remember those numbers I pushed out there. How many RPC interfaces are there in Windows? How many RPC methods are there? There's a lot more work that can be done. And. Uh... On that note, Mark, I'll just ask you kind of a follow-up question. Uh, someone was wondering if you have future development plans for the Bazaar package. 
uh, uh, yes, there will be the, the white listing features, the being able to enable or disable specific attack techniques from detection or, or reporting, and then also additional attack techniques, maybe about another seven or eight or nine that I worked on uh, a couple of months ago that will be published soon. Great. Uh, James, I think that this is a question for you. Uh, is there a FileBeats module for Zeek? And if so, are they written in ECS, uh, like Elastic Common Schema, I believe? So uh, the Elastic Common Schema is still evolving. Uh, so I don't believe there's one yet, but I believe that there will be. Uh, and sorry, what was the, the first part of your question? Uh, the question was, is there a FileBeats module for Zeek? And if so, are they written in ECS? Okay, and yes, there is a file. I believe it's a FileBeats module. Um, there was a pull request for it a couple of months ago. Uh, I, I'll have to follow follow up with that. If you can, if the person who submitted it can provide their email address, I can provide you the detailed answer. But I do recall a couple of months ago that there was a pull request so that it would be implemented and easy to implement, easier to implement. Uh, yep, we've got that person's email, so I'll be able to share that question with you directly, James, and you can follow up. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Uh, it says, will community ID include timestamp in the future? So when uh, Christian wrote community ID, uh, he wrote it with the ability to be modular and evolve. Currently, it does not include time, uh, and that was a, an explicit choice that they made. Um, if you have a reason why you think time would be needed, I'm sure he would be open to having that feedback uh, posted on GitHub. But that's unfortunately, that's all I can share for now. Okay. Uh, we've got time probably for another two or three questions here before the end of the hour. Um, we have a question about the notice log. You mentioned the notice log throughout this presentation. Can you talk more about what that log is and how it works? James, do you want to address that one? Uh, the notice, sure. I was going to say, Mark, how about you? Um, the notice log is an opportunity to, uh, to say, provide notices, but it, it's really the framework that Zeke uses to, I'm going to say, alert in air quotes, to alert uh, network operators of something that has occurred. It's not an alert because oftentimes when we generate alerts, there are tens of them, hundreds of them. A notice is something that is very explicitly configured to provide information. Um, and so it's one of the frameworks that's with Zeek that is configurable. Great. Um, I think we've got time for one more question here. Uh, this is a Zeek question I think both of you guys can probably answer. Uh, how does Zeek deal with encrypted traffic? James, maybe if you want to start off. Sure. I, I would look at that and say, so what Zeek does with encrypted traffic is uh, there's a log for X509 that has information about certificates, everything about the certificate that can be logged. Uh, there's also an SSL log that records information about the TLS handshake that takes place. Uh, there's also an SSH log. So those are the kind of the three primary encrypted logs uh, that provides a lot of valuable information, even when the session is encrypted. Uh, Zeek also has the ability with an external device performing a, kind of a, a man in the middle to provide a second feed. You can then have both kind of the inside the tunnel content as well as the outside the tunnel content. So you can have the best of both worlds. Uh, that, that's really what I would look at. And there are some things that can also be inferred uh, from that SSH connection. But I, I think that's that's a conversation for another follow-on webinar. Great, uh, Mark. Anything to add to that before we wrap up? Uh, no, just to say that uh, sometimes the RPC, the data payload, can be encrypted, and there's there's not a whole lot we could do with that. We just ignore the RPC data payload. And with SMB version three, that I believe that whole packet is encrypted. So there's not I'm not sure what can be done with that. But I did want to follow back up, if I could circle back to that question about remote desktop protocol or doing, you know, Mitre is open to community input on Bazaar. It's posted on GitHub. It's available for community input. So there's contact information on that on that Bazaar GitHub page. So if you're interested in contributing, please 
please uh, follow follow that link and and we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, Mark, James, thank you so much for your time today. There's some questions we didn't get to answer, but we have logged them and we've got your email. So we'll follow up with you guys. And uh, there will be a recording, as I mentioned, made available, and we will follow up with registrants with the slide and recording when it's available. Um, so with that, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll call it a wrap. Thanks, Mark and James. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. You're welcome. Bye-bye.